Good afternoon, Chachrei Tzoraim Tovim. This session will be held in English. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Michal Beller. The downside of not having Thais here, here is obvious, but the upside is that we have, will have the whole time dedicated to one topic, and it will allow uh, the speaker, the distinguished speaker, to speak longer, and for you to participate, ask questions, and have a real discussion. So there is some advantage also to the change that we've heard about. Few words, um, as I've been also in Rama involved in a teacher evaluation, I understand how complex it is. So just a few words to introduce the topic. As we all know that research finds teachers as the most important school influence on students. That's one thing. Also, we also find that teachers appear to vary widely in effectiveness as measured by student gains uh, on various measures. Teachers have long run measurable effects on life outcome, outcomes. By many measures, teacher quality is inequitably distributed across students and schools, which is very unfortunate. If teachers are so important, what are we doing to ensure high quality teachers and how can we make sure that they're found all across the country in our case or in, in other places around the world, also in the periphery, etc. So there are two key issues that are of relevance here. What is teacher quality and how do we measure it? A very complex issue and even more important, what policies are most effective in improving the level and distribution of teacher quality. And I hope that we will be able to learn about this from the distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Drew Gitomer, and I'd like to introduce him to you briefly. Dr. Gitomer, Drew Gitomer, joined the faculty of the Rutgers University Graduate School of Education as the Rose and Nicholas de Marzo Chair in Education in September 2011. His research centers on the assessment and evaluation of teaching and related policy issues in teaching and teacher education. His current work focuses on a range of constructs, including the quality of classroom interactions, teacher knowledge, teacher beliefs, and student achievement. He and his colleagues are carrying out validity studies, which is rather rare, I should say, of a variety of measures, including classroom observation protocols, classroom assignment protocols, and new measures of teacher knowledge. Through this work, Dr. Gitomer and his colleagues always thrive to make progress on understanding the contextual factors that influence the quality of teaching that is observed. Prior to coming to Rutgers, luckily for me, because he recruited me to ETS. Dr. Gitomer was a researcher and a senior vice president of research at Educational Testing Service in Princeton, New Jersey, where he most recently led the Understanding Teaching Quality Center. In addition to the examination of academic profiles of individuals entering teacher, teaching, Dr. Gitomer's previous work includes research on the development of assessments for the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, the NBPTS, I'm sure all, you're all aware of it. He uh, has also conducted research on assessments for students, all from the perspective of developing assessment methods that are directly related to instruction and to learning. Dr. Gitomer is currently co-editing the AERA Handbook of research on teaching and was also co-editor of educational evaluation and policy analysis from 2006 to 2009. Nine, I'm sorry. Uh, with no further ado, I invite you, Drew. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much. And thank you so much to the all the conference organizers. This has been a wonderful conference, and I, I, you know, I appreciate the invitation, and, and especially on the uh, birthday of uh, David Yellen. So, um, so thank you. Uh, 
what I'd like to do today is um, is oh, let me is talk to you a little bit about um, a teacher evaluation and and specifically uh, what we might consider a grand experiment in the United States. Um, we are engaging in a very significant uh, enterprise of conducting teacher evaluation to really transform and, and try to reform education, or at least that's the promise. And so what I want to do today is, is bring findings from our own research that I think speak to the potential for these issues, uh, for the uh, progress, um, potential progress and potential effects of this, this revolution, and also to raise some significant cautions. Um, what I'd like to do is give you a sense of the rationale for why the states are, are moving forward uh, on evaluation so aggressively, to detail some of the methods that are being used, and I want to specifically focus on classroom observation today, um, and that's because it is the measure most closely linked to practice, and it's also, of course, one of the uh, me dominant methods that uh, is being used in this country. And, and then I'd like to uh, share with you uh, my concerns, but also try to close with an optimistic but cautious uh, vision. Now, why do we, uh, why is there be such a push for teacher evaluation? Well, there's been a dissatisfaction, a long-standing dissatisfaction with uh, how teaching got evaluated. So, so there's been a, a concern about the educational performance in the country, and yet, uh, when one looked at these uh, sort of teacher evaluations that came out, one always saw that almost everybody was rated satisfactory. So this, there was this disconnect. And, um, and even more so, when there were teachers who were clearly not up to the task of teaching our students, the idea of being able to uh, take action on them, to remove them, was uh, nearly, it was extremely rare, and when it was, when it did occur, it was extremely expensive and time consuming, and that created frustrations, and, and I think policymakers particularly were frustrated when they um, felt that the system was in, in, unable to sort of take action on the most obvious sort of uh, uh, instances. And so that created an almost uh, emotional, visceral response to say something had to be done, and I think that underlies some of the uh, actions that have been taken. But, but as Michal said, there's also been an awful lot of research uh, over the last decade or so that demonstrated that teachers, in fact, did have um, a significant impact on the educational uh, performance of students and how much they learned. Now, um, one of, and she carefully said, it's the teach, teachers are the most important educational factor. In some quarters, that has been misinterpreted to say that teachers are the most important factor, period. And in fact, that has um, led to policies that haven't paid attention to the most important factors, which are families, poverty, all sorts of situations like, conditions like that, that have a much more important effect on student outcomes. Now, the other press for evaluation came from the inadequacy of the measures that had existed uh, heretofore. So all of the kinds of steps that have been taken to license teachers, the kinds of uh, ways that we reward teachers based on experience, none of those things, and, and, and also degrees, none of those things were shown to have a relationship to student outcomes. So we have a system of sort of trying to control quality and those, all those steps don't seem to be uh, explicitly related to the quality of teaching. So the inadequacy of that combined with the research base led to a sense that we ought to um, engage in some more systematic evaluation. And tied to that also that larger zeitgeist is basically a concern about the rigor and value of teacher education. And so lots of what I'm going to talk about today is moving into the sphere of teacher education as well. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of methods that are being used to um, evaluate teachers, and, and I'm going to couch this within the, federal, the US federal initiative, uh, the race to the top competition. And, 
And the idea here is that teachers need to be evaluated for states and schools to get uh, certain funding. And the, um, a significant component of that evaluation has to be tied to student achievement growth. And I say growth because there are models that try to account for um, the prior achievement of students. So it's not simply looking at the status scores to say that teachers of students who achieve more highly are necessarily better teachers than those who don't. So there's been lots of uh, research and lots of controversy, in fact, on these kinds of methods. I'm not going to talk a, a lot about those, but basically these models use the annual student achieve, standardized student achievement scores and look at ch changes in those scores and try to associate particular teachers with the students that they teach and the changes in those scores to um, establish a causal relationship that the teacher caused added value to those students. And um, that's been um, problematic on lots of dimensions. And one of the most significant dimensions is logistically it's problematic and that only about a third of the teachers in the states actually can be measured by these kinds of things. And so what has happened, and that's because um, teachers that teach subjects that aren't tested annually cannot be measured by these value added or growth models. Um, those who are uh, teaching the arts and music and gym and uh, special education all uh, cannot, uh, it's, it's impossible to get estimates of their value added in those, with this sort of technology. So what has happened is there's also a move to develop what we call student learning objectives, which is to establish learning objectives and create some sort of assessments to um, assess to the extent to which the students of particular teachers have met those objectives. That, um, I can say, is largely um, a mess. Um, so uh, there are some pockets where there's some interesting stuff going on, but by and large, it's, it's an attempt to uh, uh, feed an engine that says student achievement is important with all sorts of processes that violate almost everything we know about measurement. Um, so I'm going to focus on observations, uh, but there are other measures as well, and those that states are using to varying extent. Some are surveys by the students or parents. Uh, there might be inclusion of evidence about professional activities. Um, School-based factors, school-based level achievement can it also influence teacher evaluation scores depending on the state or district and, and how they uh, figure out the um, overall measure of teaching. And so then all of these various measures that people use, and all of them use some sort of student achievement measure and observation measures, these other things vary, all of those are then combined into some sort of uh, measure, uh, aggregate score, and there are different ways of aggregating those scores, and that comes to some sort of uh, final teacher evaluation metric that classifies people as being in several categories, and with a particular focus on those at the very bottom, at the very top, and, the, and at the very bottom, those are the people that there might be action taken to remove them, not give them tenure, and at the top, in some places, there are uh, moves to have additional sorts of compensation. So um, let me move to um, the, uh, the observation protocols. Now, the protocols that are being used today, and, and I'm somewhat familiar with the model that's been developed in Israel, and the models I'm going to talk about share lots of characteristics with those models, are looking for judgments of complex interactions in the classroom. And that is a, um, it, it's a shift from the old models of evaluation that simply looked at teacher behaviors. These models are looking at the students and teachers together and the interactions among those, which require fairly complex um, measures. And those observations are done through a lens that is represented by the protocol. So the protocol sort of tries to guide the observer on how to see that practice. And learning how to see that is in, an attempt to sort of create some commonality, some shared sense and, and some agreement that people can uh, contend are, it qualifies as 
um, good teaching or weaker teaching. And so, so, so the idea is to create a common lens, a common protocol across the system. And to do that, and to do that with these complex judgments requires significant training. It re requires certification um, of the people that they can actually do this and they can make their judgments not idiosyncratically, not in their own view, but to do, make those judgments based on the common lens. In fact, it should be a matter of indifference whether I look at that teacher or somebody else looks at the teacher if we're using the same tool. And so all of this means that what we're really talking about is a system, an observation system. Now sometimes people will say we use the observation rubric, we use the Danielson rubric. A rubric is a piece of paper. The system is all of the machinery that goes around that, including the piece of paper, but all the training and certification and quality controls that try to ensure that people can do this in a systematic, consistent kind of basis. And, um, and the systems are being proposed to do two things. A lot of the focus has been on the human capital decisions, who to hire, who to fire, um, who to compensate more. Uh, and, and I'm not going to get deeply into that because I think that carries with it lots of problems and we can discuss that later on. But I'm going to focus today more on this, the way that these observation systems have the potential to improve teaching and to be used in that direction. And I'd say that these, these two goals sometimes are actually in conflict with each other and we can talk a little bit about that. Okay. So let's start with what we might call a theory of action for how um, <clears throat> these observation systems should work. Now the first thing is that we ought to be, the first stage at the top, is that we ought to be able to um, make uh, accurate and reliable judgments that tell us about the skill demonstrated by each teacher. Now we're going to do that through the various components of the evaluation system, but we're going to focus specific uh, of the, of the uh, evaluation system, we're going to focus specifically on observation. So if the observation can help us understand that in a meaningful way, then the idea is that that information ought to lead to insights about teaching, there ought to be actions then taken um, through things like professional development and coaching, and and that ultimately should lead to more effective teaching practice. Now the research that I'm going to focus on, and most of the research has, that has been to date, has not examined this entire theory of action, but what it has focused on is this first piece, the information. To what extent can we get reliable and accurate information about um, teachers? And so let me just define for the moment what accuracy and reliability is and the way we think about it. So, so we talked about using this lens and we have these people that have designed these protocols who are the experts in the lens and we consider them to be the sort of true measures. That their judgments are the true measures of what quality is. And, we, um, and so these master coders are people that we ask to look at videos of practice and actually code them as well. And for accuracy, we're looking at the extent to which the observers in these various research studies actually agree, or principles, would agree to the same sorts of ratings as the master coders. So it's accuracy against the standard as represented by what these master coders would give. Reliability is the extent to which scores are free from variety of influences. For example, as I mentioned, who gave the scores? It shouldn't matter who the rater was. It shouldn't at some level matter uh, when the scores were given, if they were given on a Tuesday or a Friday in the morning or the afternoon. Uh, it shouldn't matter when they, when, um, uh, what was the subject matter that was taught if we're looking at this underlying construct called teacher quality. Now the fact is that all these things matter. And they matter a lot. And so what we try to do in building an evaluation system is try to control for all of that by balancing these things out. So we want to measure, uh, we want to uh, have multiple raters look at teachers over time. So it's not just me 
who looks at the teacher with, it, with whatever sort of scheme that I have because I'm going to be imperfect in particular kinds of ways. It means looking at multiple lessons because teaching is going to vary from lesson to lesson. And, um, and so the idea is that we really try to work with multiple raters, multiple observations to try to control for the lack of reliability within the system. That said, we're still trying to improve certain reliability and particularly the, rate, the reliability between observers. So, <clears throat> so let me, um, so I'm going to sort of foreground the results and then we'll walk through them. Uh, we've done multiple studies in multiple school districts and, and what we find is that observers actually have a, a very difficult time making accurate and consistent judgments. Um, particularly on the, the instructional aspects, the dimensions of instruction. The, the kinds of things that focus on content, teaching material, reasoning, that's what's very difficult to make judgments about. People are much more able to make judgments about things like the, the behavior in the classroom, to the extent to which the classroom is organized. Um, and, and even uh, though our observers get more accurate over time, they do continue to be unreliable. They do disagree with each other in substantial kinds of ways. Um, and these problems are systemic. We find that teachers have difficulty judging their own practice. Observers have difficulty judging practice. As we start working with principals in schools, we find that they're having a difficult time judging practice. And so, um, so all of this represents real challenges to using observation systems well unless the whole system is designed in particular kinds of ways. Okay, so, so the studies, first of all, let me, let me just back for a second and say that we study teaching quality. We don't study teacher quality. And what we can see when we observe a classroom at best is the kind of teaching that students are experiencing. But that teaching is the residue not just of the teacher, but of the curriculum, of policy decisions, of leadership, of all sorts of things, of, of the students in that classroom. All of those things affect the kind of teaching that's observed. And there's a whole other inference that has to be made about the extent to which it is the teacher. So, so we focus on the teaching. And, um, and we have done our studies in, primarily in middle school and high school. Uh, in math and English language arts. And we've used multiple measures, including evaluated based on student achievement, observations, uh, student, the quality of assignments that are given to students in the classroom and the work that they do on those assignments. We have been working a lot on teacher content knowledge, um, content knowledge for teaching that comes out of the work of Lee Shulman, Deborah Ball. And, um, and, and I want to really emphasize that what we also have here are highly trained independent raters. So the people who've been functioned as the observers in our studies are former teachers who've worked basically full time on the projects. They get to see lots of classrooms every day or, or videos of classrooms. Each day we have weekly retraining or calibration ses sessions. So in a sense the data I'm going to present to you is the best case. And these are independent people. They do not have to go to lunch with these people. They do not have to work with them. They do not have to run a school and think about the impact of making judgments. So these are sort of the, the ideal observation system and you will see that they still have lots of uh, uh, trouble. We've studied a number of different um, uh, observation systems. Uh, <clears throat> we have studied Danielson, which I think most of you are familiar with. The class model, which comes out of Virginia, I'm going to talk mostly about that. And the results, though, that I'm going to share are basically very much parallel with the work we find in Danielson. Both those protocols are general. They're designed to cover uh, across subjects, across grade levels. But we've also studied subject-specific protocols, um, protocols designed simply, strictly for math, the MQI, and strictly for English language arts. And they detail a lot more about what does it mean to teach math, mathematics effectively, or language arts effectively? All of these protocols, uh, raters, observers, rate dimensions of performance, some number of them, 10 plus or minus some number, 
and those dimensions are organized into uh, domains which represent the higher level constructs which we're trying to uh, get uh, um, an understanding of. Okay, so this is the class observation protocol, just to give you a sense. This is um, uh, a measure of classroom. So overall, we have classroom quality. We have three domains, emotional support, classroom organization, instructional support, and we can see that there are a uh, number of dimensions under each one of those domains. To give you a sense of what the protocol looks like, uh, this is a particular dimension, analysis and problem solving. You can see a description at the top. And then you can see that there are, it's a seven point scale. There's a low, mid and high point that are anchored by these indicators. So what does it look like at these different levels? And then there are these um, elements that one can use that helps to guide the uh, observer as they're looking. So they would judge each of those particular things. They wouldn't assign a score, but they would consider those and, may, um, and then make judgments about um, the overall quality on each of these particular elements and then summarize it and say, for this segment, it's a one through seven sort of score. The, um, the way this works is that the observer observes for a period of time, something like 15 minutes, takes notes, and then, then uh, stops and takes a score. If it's live, this is sort of a seven minute dead period where you're not observing and you're scoring, taking advantage of all the evidence you've collected, the notes to make the judgments, or in video, you can actually stop, take advantage of the video score, and then start again. So a given lesson might have two, three, four, five segments. Okay, so let's look at scores. Um, what we see here, remember it's a seven point scale, four is sort of mid-level. We see that when we look at classroom organization, um, scores look pretty high. We see classrooms, and these are urban classrooms largely. We see classrooms that are well behaved. We see that they're organized, kids are busy doing stuff, they're on task. But when we look at the emotional support, we see it much um, more modest. And when we look at instructional support, we see it even less. So we see classrooms where there's just not a lot of cognitive demand on the students. There isn't um, significant questioning and feedback cycles. We don't see the kinds of behaviors, uh, teaching behaviors, that we would associate with high degrees of learning. Um, and this, by the way, is not wholly different than sort of general observations of classrooms that go back 20, 30 years, back to John Goodlad and others. So this is a picture now using these sch schemes that yields the same sort of picture. Now, when we look at agreement, we see agreement that's actually pretty low. And the agreement here, this is a seven point scale. So these are, this is agreement levels where they have to have an exact agreement. And so these are average over dimensions across the domains. And we see, and we have two columns here. One is agreeing with another rater. So when two raters look at the same lesson, and another looks at agreement with an expert score. And we see that when um, the agreement levels, exact agreements are, are quite modest, except they get a little bit higher when we start looking at the classroom organization. Again, they can make better uh, judgments about certain aspects of instruction. But when we say that they don't agree at all, it's not just random disagreement. It's, it, it's actually more systematic than that. So let's take a look at this. If we look at, um, okay, if we look at when an expert gives it a score of two, we see that the scores are actually clustered at two and three. So, so they do give a lot of threes, they give some fours, fives, once in a while this, but basically they're in this neighborhood. When the expert gives a four, we see that most of the scores are clustered here. And when we see the expert giving a six, we see that the scores are clustered here. So it's not the case that they're just random scores and people don't see things. They're just not agreeing exactly. And what that means, the implication of that is that if you want really reliable scores, if you do multiple observations, you're going to get that out of this sort of signal. So the more observations you do, the more um, reliable the overall estimate is of 
sort of where, where, where that teacher stands. Now, one of the interesting things we found is how scoring changes over time. Now, if you just observe teachers live, if, so if you go into classrooms over the course of a year and observe, the observer is getting more experience, but the teaching's changing over a year. So maybe after three months, you don't like the kids anymore, and you know, so it's not going so hot. So you, you can't differentiate the two things. But we could, and we could because we used video. So what we could do is mix up the videos when they observed. So we now have lessons from the beginning of the year, end of the year, ordered in random kinds of ways, so they're not confounded, and we could watch changes in the observer's behavior as independent of when the teaching occurred. And when we do that, we see that it changes a lot. This is the instructional domain. So as these raters scored more and more videos, they got, they got tougher and tougher, closer and closer actually to the master codes. And, um, and again, this is with lots of training and lots of experience, more than any principal is going to get in the classroom, in the, in the real practice. So, and this could make significant differences in the scores that are given. Again, what this argues for is you want multiple observations taken over the course of the year so that it balances out the kind of noise that can occur within these systems. But, but when it occurs, could actually have, when the scoring occurs, can have a large impact. Okay, so overall, um, oh, and let me just say, I mentioned this video live. One of the things we found is there's not a big difference between the video and live observations. So we actually scored independently the same classrooms that we observed live with the, through the video, different raters rating different lessons, so they hadn't seen that lesson before. And we find that there's, a, there's some small differences, but by and large, the correlation between scores is extremely high, and any interpretations based on video or live is, is, is similar. Um, but what we do find is that if you looked at just a single rating, it would be, uh, it would be very sensitive to who conducted the rating, when it was conducted, um, but it wouldn't matter whether it was done by live or video. And even with experience, these raters are a source of inconsistency, so that by averaging over lessons and raters, we can get a better estimate. Um, so we do need these multiple judgments. Now let me move to, um, so how do teachers judge themselves? So what we have here is class, the class folks, and this is the University of Virginia folks, Bob Pianta, Bridget Hamry, and colleagues, what they did is develop a, a teach yourself evaluation instrument. They rated themselves on the same dimension, same domains as, um, as the observers did. And if we look at classroom organization, what we see here the light colored uh, is the um, observer's ratings, the dark color is the teacher's self ratings. We see that the raters actually observed, the, uh, this gave scores that were higher than the teacher's ratings, or relatively higher. These aren't exactly the same scale, so take it with a grain of salt for those who are method methodological sticklers. Um, but the basic idea is that raters are giving them s teachers slightly higher scores. But when we look at the correlation, the relationship between uh, teachers' ratings and observers' ratings, there's a significant, pretty strong correlation. Teachers who actually manage classrooms better are given higher ratings. They have a sense of where they are, and those who struggle give themselves lower ratings. With emotional support, we start seeing a mix, a, a, a shift here we see that the teachers rate themselves more highly than the raters rate themselves. And there, though there's a correlation, it's much smaller. When we move to instructional support, we see something even more different. We see absolutely no relationship between what goes on in the classroom from the observer's perspective and how the teacher judges their own practice. So those who receive the highest observation scores and those who receive the lowest observation scores rate themselves the same in the, um, on the self-evaluation. So, so all of this you know, starts to paint a picture here of, oh, let me go back. So all of this begins to paint this picture that there just is certain things, 
certain aspects of instruction are just very difficult to judge. We don't have a common language, a common understanding. There's no shared sense of what it means to carry out instruction effectively. And if we're going to move the ball forward on trying to improve the system, we're going to have to um, do some things a bit differently. Now, I want to go from these research studies with these highly trained uh, folks and all the struggles you're seeing here to say, well, what are we seeing when we actually move out into the field? So these are data that come out of the research studies. So this is work that's been done in our studies, in the MET study uh, that was recently done, Measures of Effective Teaching, large, a very large study. Um, when we look at Danielson, we see that on the instructional domain, we see that m most t teachers are rated uh, in the second category, the developing and needs improvement. And 24%, one quarter, are rated proficient, nobody's rated exemplary, and nobody's ineffective. And in essence, we have a two-point scale. And so, so we, we look at this in contrast to the historically high scores that people have gotten in evaluation systems and ask, well, how is this going to play out? How is this beginning to play out when states are actually using these systems in evaluations of teachers. So I'm going to present to you data that's come out of a pilot from one of the states, and that is actually representative of data that we see in other states as well. And this is using the Danielson protocol as well. Okay, so we see now a huge shift. So these are folks that have been trained on Danielson, they've used the videos, and they now are um, proficient and exemplary uh, and there's very few needs improvement. Now part of the problem is that in some states, needs improvement is now um, taken as a, a, uh, a, a flag that somebody's about ready to be fired. Okay, so now we've corrupted the sense of what it means to need improvement. If we're ever going to need improvement, you know, if the system needs improvement, if we look at teaching from all the research data that we see and say, you know, we need to improve teaching overall as a system, and now you've got data or, 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 or legislation that basically says needs improvement is needs firing, um, you've now corrupted things in a way that you can't have that sort of more sophisticated discussion to say, how do we improve ourselves? Because you've already said, well, everybody's proficient, so what do I have to work on? Um, and, and I think that's what we're going to see more and more of actually in the system. And, and, and why might we see this? Well, part of the reason is that um, there's sort of, in, in education, we like, to be, we like to be nice, right? Um, but part of it is, that we might not be able to be a, seeing instruction very well. If we can't make those judgments, if all we can do is make judgments about uh, of classroom organization, that looks pretty good. And if you have uh, principals coming in who don't understand the subject matter they're observing, um, it's likely that they're gonna focus on those things they can get a handle on, and it's if it's well behaved, if it's organized, looks good, and people actually look proficient. Okay, um, so, So we have this problem, right? We, uh, people are struggling to understand how to use these protocols, but they also don't have an image of what instruction, good instruction looks like. And we're seeing these sorts of scores unfold with very little distribution and very little similarity to what we see in the sort of master codes and, and, and all, in the research studies. And so, um, so how are we going to improve things? Well. I think that there are uh, a couple of ways to do this. One is sort of the uh, simpler, more direct way that will get us a little bit, and that is to continue to refine the systems, develop better rating systems, conduct multiple observations, do it as well as we're doing the research studies, um, try to continue to promote common understanding and, um, and develop sort of systematic plans for how to use this information to improve teaching. But I want to close with something that's um, 
a little bit more uh, dramatic. And that is that if we're going to really transform the system, if, we can use, if we're going to use these observation systems to really improve practice, then we really need to address this idea that, that the system does not understand, uh, that, that the participants, the stakeholders in the system, do not have this shared understanding of instruction. And so when we talk about reliability and, and validity, this is not just a, a problem for psychometrics. You know, it's a marker that there isn't this shared understanding and we cannot move the system unless we're talking about the same thing. Otherwise, we just talk past, cross, talk past each other. So, so if we're going to do this, one of the ways to do this is to have an audit process, to actually send some videos out to independent experts, arbiters, to come back to the system and say, you know, you said all this was really good, but here's what we see. Because we're not just building systems to evaluate teachers. When we're talking about building reliability, it's also to build capacity of the leadership in the districts to, to understand practice so they can support it. Because if they don't, they're going to be focusing on the things that may not actually result in the kinds of instructional improvements that we need. The other thing we need to do is we really need to look at system patterns in teaching. The whole model of uh, the policy model right now is to identify the sort of specific teachers as the cause of problems. And what we're seeing is actually the homogeneity of practice. We go into schools and what characterizes it is not the differences of finding the terrible teacher and let's, let's just remove that teacher. But actually we find modest practice that is shared and, and alarmingly common from classroom to classroom. They're not bad classrooms. You don't go in and, and you know, cringe. They're, like I said, they're well behaved, they're polite, they're nice, but there's just not a lot of stuff going on intellectually. Um, we need to provide feedback in words. The model that just classifies people in categories of one, two, three, and four sort of violates everything we know about human performance judgments in all sorts of professions. People, putting people in bins doesn't work. Saying you're high, low, or average, saying people are average is not particularly motivating either. Um, I, I assume none of us have been sort of really got juiced when we were called average. So, um, but, but giving people specific feedback actually does improve practice. And so we need to be able to do that. And that means having clear understanding of what's going on that has meaning. Because if, the, if, if teachers are getting feedback that they know just doesn't mean anything, that's not going to be particularly useful either. I think we've got to move to shared accountability systems. And that is teachers have to partake in this sort of thing. It can't just be having sort of the administration doing it to the teachers. If we're going to move in reasonable ways, if we're going to have people who are expert in the subject matter judging other teachers and providing meaningful feedback, somehow we have to break this idea that there's administrators who do evaluation and teachers who get evaluated. But how are we going to make them part of the process as part of a professional community that is actually a mark of professionalism in most other uh, professions. And, and I think more and more we have to co-observe so that it's not just one person walking in because there's an awful lot of learning that can happen when multiple pro professionals are observing that same phenomena and, and working together on this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> um, <laughs> Oops, I lost it. Okay, so anyway, um, <clears throat> I had a pithy quote at the end, but I lost it with the technology here. So anyway, let me close by just thanking you all and, uh, and uh, look forward to having discussion after this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Drew. It was fascinating, and I understand that we still need to do a lot of research and a lot of work to understand better how to do this right, because we understand now how wrong sometimes we are when we do it uh, in the way we do it. Um, we have now 10 minutes for discussion. We have already one person who registered for, to comment, so that's Dr. Elizabeth Cooper Camp from Harlem Success Academy. Where are you, please? Can you, okay, would you like to come on board, maybe over there, and you can take the um, mic. So you have like up to five minutes, and then we'll leave five minutes for the.
too weird. <laughs> I'll come sit with you. <laughs> this light is very bright. Um, can you hear me? Okay. So I wanted to start by saying that I was really glad you did not talk about using test scores to judge the system in America, because that is a total disaster and has even more problems than using teacher observation. So we'll just start with that. And then if you look at this, I want to look at this briefly from the point of view of the teacher, because I think sometimes when we're talking in these big terms, we forget how the teacher feels about all of this. And Having worked with many, many teachers over the years, the way teachers feel about being observed is they are petrified. Fear and trembling is the best word to describe how teachers experience being observed, whether it's their principal, a coach, or someone coming from, to observe them from some random study. They hate it. Okay, so that's the beginning. However, I think they have to be observed. <laughs> I think you are totally right. It is the only way we're ever going to get a national system of understanding what's good in education. And I think what the more useful way to look at this entire problem is we, in terms of educating teachers, we do have some idea of what emotional support should look like in a classroom, what instruction should look like, and what classroom behavior should look like. As people who educate teachers, we have an idea of what that should be. And I think what, what we owe to the teachers who are moving up into this profession is to teach them how to do this. If we know this is what's going to be observed, we need to teach them how to do it so when they are observed, they're passing, that they're more than proficient, that they're, they're actually exemplary teachers. So that's the one thing I think we can take away from this is we need to take this data to then say, okay, how do we teach this? The second thing we need to teach teachers is how to take help. And we talked about this some in one of the last conferences I was in. And I think it's very hard for teachers to know when they're observed, you know, what you were just saying. If we give them a number, they have no idea what to do with the number two. So I was a two today. They don't know what that means. But if we tell them, okay, if we came in and watched your class, and yes, all the children were sitting down and they were looking good, but the content of your lesson was approximately zilch. We need to actually tell them what to do with that. How do you put content in? And they need, when they're learning to be teachers, they need to learn how to take help. And I think that we are failing almost completely in that regard, that they have no idea what to do with an observation. I mean, I observe people that I supervise all the time, and I have to teach them how to take their supervision. They simply don't know how to do that. And I think that we're not doing a very good job there. So that's my major comment. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Bill, would you like to comment on this? Or should we open the floor for more questions? Okay. Me too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Any more questions, comments? Please? Uh, here, can someone move the mic? Uh, I'd like to address the issue of teacher training to the, exactly what you said before about emotional support, instructive support, which both of you spoke about, and also classroom management, teachers being aware of those parameters as things that will be judged. But uh, teachers in a state of emotional insecurity, uh, you said they're petrified, I love what you said, because that doesn't just happen to the experienced teacher, it happens especially in the teacher training setup, where our young people are very unsure of themselves and very, very insecure about their self-image. And then every word of critique, you spoke about help, that's what I want to ask about. How can we give critique in a way that it will be heard, that it will be uh, useful to, towards building teachers when they are in such a vulnerable state of feeling extremely insecure about who they are and when our job is to give them critique, but at the same time, criticism, as we all know, is very, very uh, <laughs> damaging. So that's really what I want to ask, keeping the balance between knowing that we have to give critique and yet knowing that the people we're giving it to may not be able to take it the way we need to. No, it's not. 
Just talk, okay. Okay. Um, I think one of the. <laughs> okay. I think one of the issues is, um, or one of the signals to me, as somebody new into a teacher education institution, is that as teacher educators, we don't model some of this stuff particularly well. So one of the things that I've tried to do is say, you know, if we're going to have all of our students be doing this, we ought to do this to ourselves, essentially, to understand the dynamics of what it means to go through an evaluation like this, both cognitively, but also emotionally, right? And I will tell you that I've gotten very mixed sort of um, pushback on that. Some of the people absolutely agree, but others are extremely reluctant to do that. And so I think sort of engaging in processes that start to model that, to say we do this as a profession is something that teacher education can actually take on and begin to do. And um, so that's just one, one small reaction to that. Okay, enough. I have two questions. One is maybe I missed something, but did you say anything about the agreement between experts? It seems to me that that's a very important point to see if the missing link is the knowledge of the evaluator or the tool. So I'd like to have some information about that. And the second question is, um, when you talk about preparing or, or developing capacity of the evaluators, it seems to me that maybe the problem is the complexity of the task. Because good teaching is so complex, and as being involved in only in professional development of only some of, very few of the dimensions you mentioned, I know how lengthy this process is. So my question is, is it at all a realistic goal to expect that when you want to prepare people to assess, you would really give them a deep knowledge of all the instructional dimensions? Or maybe we have a caveat here that is very, would be very difficult to overcome. Right. So, um, a couple of answers to that. The, um, I think we're in a place now with the research teams that have been working on these protocols where there is, is pretty good agreement among the experts. That was not always the case. And I will tell you, when we first started this project a few years ago with the Danielson Protocol, I had this concern that the experts actually didn't agree with each other. And so, we asked Charlotte to, to give the same videos to multiple observers, multiple experts, and in fact, they didn't agree at all. Now, since that time, and as this stuff moved from sort of this professional development space into um, more evaluation process, they've gotten much more disciplined about it, built much more supports, and, and what we've seen is that the ratings are much more similar. I think on class and Plato, a few of the others, the raters do agree, the experts agree at a pretty high, uh, not perfectly, but pretty strongly. Um, I think it is a tremendously complicated task. I think there, um, and so even if you had expert judges, you would still be um, uh, wanting to do multiple ratings to really uh, get at a reliable estimate, if you want to have a reliable estimate for a teacher. Um, but. But even, you know, what you saw in the data that we showed, even when we, by the traditional metrics, there's not really high agreement, they're still in the neighborhood. And I think at least at that level, that's important. So they're not, we're not seeing lots of, you know, twos versus sevens. When we move into real practice and start seeing the data that we saw um, from the state, then we're starting to see just huge diversion from what an expert would say and what, um, somebody else would say, and that's why I pushed for sort of an audit process to try to bring some external sort of information to the system to try to develop. But the point is, it's a tremendously complicated task. And so this idea that you can train somebody for two days and they're good to go is just terribly naive. Um, we need to build the capacity of the system in, in much more serious ways than any of these systems are, are currently designed to do. Okay, I see a sign here that we need to finish this session. I saw a few more hands, so unfortunately that will 
have to take place during the break. Drew is here, right? So thank you very, very much on behalf of the Lord. Please don't go. Wait just one more minute of a minute of your life. It ain't over till it's over. And of course, this means today, I really hope I didn't do that. Uh, we have a Tourette speaker system, which sometimes plays classic and sometimes makes this noise. Okay. So uh, tomorrow we have a very uh, exciting day. First of all, thanks, Professor Gitomer, Professor Beller, Dr. Cooperkamp, and all the respondents. That was great. Tomorrow we have great sessions at the Moffett Institute in Tel Aviv. There's my colleague and the co-chairperson, uh, Michal, please raise your hand, Michal, Dr. Michal Golan. She's going to be in charge tomorrow, you're going to see a lot of her. And lots of plenary sessions, wonderful, wonderful lectures, parallel session, and culminating with uh, Professor Feynman Nancer's talk. And the Minister of Education is going to honor us when we are going to give special awards to people that have done wonderful things in the field of teacher education. So a great day. The road to Tel Aviv is very easy to find. Ask any Jerusalemite, they know. That's the way to Tel Aviv.